Welcome to the IISS. Uh, my name is Rahul Roy Choudhury. I am the Senior Fellow for South Asia at the Institute and the head of the South Asia program. Uh, my colleagues who will introduce themselves and I returned last week from the IISS 10th annual Track 1.5 South Asia Security Conference in Muscat, Oman in partnership with the Near East and South Asia Center of the US National Defense University. While this was the 10th year of our partnership with NISA, it was the 13th year of our relationship with the Sultanate of Oman, for which we would like to express our gratitude to His Majesty the Sultan for continuing to support this series of conferences. For the IISS, uh, this was the toughest regional conference to have organized since the 2008 Mumbai terror attacks. For our December 2008 Oman conference, we had one aggrieved party, India. Today, we have three main aggrieved parties in the region, India, Pakistan and Afghanistan. But despite such heightened regional tensions, we had at the Oman conference an unprecedented level of official participation. Senior foreign ministry officials from Afghanistan, India and Pakistan, a unique plenary session with intelligence chiefs and top-serving intelligence officials of Afghanistan, Pakistan, India and Bangladesh, a top diplomat of the Chinese government, top UK and US government officials and military officers, and for the first time, participation from the Islamic Republic of Iran. We expect to continue to build on this strong level of official participation at next year's South Asia Security Conference in Oman. As the Oman conference was off the records, off the record, my colleagues and I will be focusing in this discussion session on key regional security trends rather than directly referring to the conference itself. So let me start now by briefly speaking on a key theme of the Oman conference, which was on India Pakistan relations and tensions, and on which I have three points to make for my part of this discussion. The first point is that I have not seen for the last eight years since the 2008 Mumbai terror attacks such a level of continued heightened tension for the past 10 months and even sharper rhetoric between uh, the two countries, India and Pakistan. Remember, it was in December 2015 that the two countries' national security advisors, foreign secretaries, foreign ministers and even prime ministers met. Following the attack on an Indian army base in Pathankot in Indian Punjab by Pakistan-based militants in January this year, unrest in Jammu and Kashmir for the past three months, and the attack on an Indian army camp in Uri last month, the Indian government carried out limited counter-terror operations against militant <coughs> camps across the line of control, the de facto border between India and Pakistan in Kashmir. For the first time, the Indian government publicly stated that its forces had crossed the LOC, thereby significantly reversing a strongly held belief within the Indian security establishment over the sanctity of the line of control. While Pakistan has strongly denied that any such cross-border assault has taken place, stating instead that this was an attempt to divert attention away from India's troubles in Kashmir, its forces have been brought to a heightened state of alert a severe spurts of exchanges of cross-border firing and shelling continue to take place across both the LOC and the International Stroke Working Border, and India remains prepared to counter any Pakistani response to its counter-terror operations. At the same time, the sharp official rhetoric ex of exchanges between the two has been more than matched by the warlike stance of the nationalistic media in both countries. The SARC summit, scheduled to be held in Islamabad next month, has been cancelled, and a major Indian naval exercise in the Arabian Sea begins in 36 hours. The second major point I want to make is that the narrative between the two countries is, in an unprecedented manner, I believe, sharply divergent. This is not only the case for the cross-border counter-terror attacks, but more recently on the impact of cross-border shelling, the narrative on the unrest in Jammu and Kashmir, support to terror attacks in Balochistan, including last week in Quetta against the Pakistani Police Academy, on the relevance of UN Security Council resolutions as opposed to the bilateral Simla and Lahore declarations, and on the role and future 
of the UN Military Observers Group in India and Pakistan. As a result, my sense is that the ground realities in both India and Pakistan have fundamentally shifted. India now seeks the end of all support to anti-India anti militant groups operating in Pakistan. For this, it has sought to isolate Pakistan internationally, but at the same time, this has resulted in a rehyphenating of Pakistan with India in the minds of the international community. Pakistan, on the other hand, has once again put the Kashmir dispute center stage in its bilateral relations with India, stating that peace and normalization cannot take place without the resolution of the Kashmir dispute, while seeking peace with dignity. All this takes place as India gets closer to the United States and Pakistan gets closer to China. Finally, therefore, what is the way forward? My sense is that the current state of heightened tensions between India and Pakistan may well be the new normal, at least for the next several months. If this is indeed the case, India perceives that this will continue at least till a new army chief takes over in Pakistan and is able to establish himself in office. Pakistan perceives that this will continue at least till the state elections in Uttar Pradesh and the formation of a new government in Lucknow by March next year. And soon after, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif will prepare for general elections for the summer of 2018 and Prime Minister Modi for general elections in the summer of 2019, when bilateral opportunities will be sacrificed for domestic electoral wins. While both India and Pakistan state they would like to talk officially to each other, both now have clear and existing preconditions. India on terrorism and Pakistan on Kashmir. The 2007 Musharraf Manmohan Singh proposal in the making on Kashmir appears to be over. Yet optimistically speaking, neither country perceives a military clash on the border with the threat of escalation as being in either country's interest but the possibilities of misperception, misunderstanding and miscommunication remain. At the same time, official bilateral talks, including on Kashmir, are key, and both countries ought to seek to consolidate the gains made so far during past peace processes on trade relations, criminal investigations, people-to-people -people interactions, cultural and media exchanges, all among severe political challenges and in the absence of any future terror attacks. But if this new normal were to change for the better, it would essentially come down to the leaders of the two countries of India and Pakistan and the leadership they are able to display to ensure improved relations between their two countries. Perhaps this is now time to seriously seek the resumption of a back channel to ensure that this may take place. Let me leave uh, this part of the discussion uh, for the moment and turn uh, to my colleagues uh, to get their perspective on different aspects of the South Asian security environment. So let me turn first to Jack Gill. And if you could identify and sure. introduce yourself, please. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real great pleasure to be back here at IISS uh, with a panel of such good friends and scholars, as well as some friends out in the audience, and, uh, and I hope some new friends as well. Uh, my name is Jack Gill. I'm a, on the faculty of a place called the Near East South Asia Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, I am a government employee, but this afternoon I'll be speaking entirely in my personal capacity, so please don't take anything I say as somehow representative of U.S. government policy or, or anything along those lines. Uh, my charter is to offer you a few thoughts on trends that we perceive in the South Asian side on media and the threat of Daesh or ISIL, ISIS, whatever term you care to use, in the region. And the media theme follows neatly from what Rahul has just related. Because to me, media represents one of the most difficult challenges in crisis management, as we see today, and any hope of normalization, especially in the India-Pakistan bilateral dynamic, as we've seen in the past several weeks. Now, this also applies to Pakistan-Afghanistan, I think, but Rahul's use of the term warlike in describing the media atmosphere between India and Pakistan since uh, September uh, is not inappropriate. Let me hasten to add that I am by no means thinking of the press or the media as some kind of an easy target whipping boy. The press is a critical role to play in our democratic societies, and it's far too easy to blame everything on the media, 
uh, certainly something you hear across the Atlantic. However, the media can pose serious challenges to normalization in part because we're talking about democratic societies. This is especially so in this sort of 24-7 constant news cycle in which we live and the swamp of social media in which we often flounder and which I think governments often struggle to understand. If we leave aside situations where governments intentionally try to turn up the heat, uh, we have many cases where governments on one side or the other take media stories or opinion pieces as uh, the positions of the government on the other side of the border. So in other words, they read something in the press and say, oh, that's what those guys think over there when indeed it's just someone's opinion or it's a talk show host. So where we have television reporters and sort of overheated, reading-seeking talk show hosts who quickly can inflame the atmosphere. There's no lack of examples of this in the past several weeks. Indeed, to me, this could be a case study for future scholars, those of you out there, kings or elsewhere here in London looking for topics, that would be one. But this challenge, of course, is not confined to the immediate situation, and there's no lack of cases in the past where crises have grown out of relatively minor or very minor incidents or sometimes out of no incident at all. These problems, of course, are not exclusive to South Asia by any means, but this will be the backdrop to any kind of normalization process involving India and Pakistan, as Rahul uh, outlined in a somewhat hopeful ending of his remarks. The challenges of the media are compounded by three other trends. One is that there's little or no market access to each other's media. A second is the question of whether media must follow a government line or risk being labeled anti-national, whatever that means. And that has all manner of implications, of course, for press freedom and for government accountability. And the third is the decreasing familiarity of the respective populations with those across the border. That is to say that people in their 20s and 30s and 40s who have never been to the other country and only see it through some sort of distorted media lens uh, might have very un peculiar views of the opposite nation, especially in this unrestrained so-called social media space. Uh, so you have then two populations that are uh, intimately involved in situations that often devolve into violence, and yet they don't really have clear views of people on the other side of the border. It thus seems prudent to me that the two sides develop some kind of domestic strategies to socialize a normalization popu among their own populations, and media strategies that are prepared to cope with unexpected and sometimes outlandish challenges without indulging in muzzling the press, since that's a central feature of our open democratic polities and something that we cherish. This is a good way to transition into my remarks on Daesh in South Asia, because one of the other areas that involves media is the threat of infiltration of, by Daesh into South Asian countries, as this infiltration often occurs through various media, especially if we consider social media and other online means. So this is the second area I would address, and let me make four quick points. First, specialists remain divided on the nature of the Daesh threat in South Asia. Some see the group having little opportunity in the region owing to cultural and ethnic differences between South Asia and the Daesh zones in Syria and Iraq, for example. Officials and scholars argue that they, re that they remain vigilant, that is, the officials remain and governments remain vigilant, not complacent, but they do not see a serious near-term danger. Others are much more concerned, and they cite the spread of Daesh propaganda in local languages and claims of Daesh involvement in recent attacks across South Asia from Afghanistan to Bangladesh, there's also concern that actors outside of the immediate region will lend support to various Taliban factions in Afghanistan out of fear of the expanding Daesh presence. The second point would be that groups claiming allegiance to Daesh are often characterized as opportunists, that is, disgruntled members of other groups such as the Afghan Taliban who have felt slighted or sidelined in their home outfits and thus claim some kind of Daesh affiliation in the hopes of burnishing their prestige and perhaps gaining additional financial, psychological, or material support, either in their own countries or from outside. The third, is, the third point would be that many people, though not all regional specialists, increasingly see a spectrum or a continuum, a seamless networking among groups and a degree of what one called jihadi pragmatism uh, that allows collaboration and sharing of resources across group boundaries despite differences that they might have philosophically. Fourthly, one of the principal trends in the region is the concern that young people, especially young men, become radicalized in their own bedrooms, to quote one of our colleagues, even though relatively few have gone to Syria and Iraq to fight. 
And the numbers yeah. leaving South Asia to go to the Middle East to participate in violence are really quite small compared to other parts of the world. Moreover, that those that are be who are becoming radicalized are not necessarily impoverished, uneducated young men, but those with some education, perhaps even university level, and from families that could easily be called middle class or rising. In other words, young men who should have decent prospects in their home societies. So, in other words, young men who are somehow inspired rather than directed by uh, the so-called uh, Daesh in, uh, in Raqqa. This concern, of course, is not new, and it's not confined to South Asia. But it has grown in prominence, in my view, over the past 12 to 18 months, especially owing to the vicious attacks in Pakistan and Bangladesh in that time period. So with that, and again, reminder that I, I speak only for myself and not as a representative of, of Washington, let me conclude here with thanks and return things to Rahul. I'm going to cover the security situation in, in Afghanistan and the issue of the border, practical cooperation on intelligence and security between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Well, at the end of last year, the Afghan forces had suffered about 20,000 casualties in that year's fighting, an all-time high. And the Taliban's brief seizure of Kunduz, as a provincial capital, was a strategic shock. What have we seen this year? Well, earlier this year, the death of Taliban leader Mullah Mansour in a US drone attack in, in Pakistan and his replacement by Hazabullah Akhundzada uh, did not reduce Taliban military performance. And Taliban efforts to conduct spectacular attacks in Kabul and other major population centres achieved some success. Elsewhere, the <coughs> Taliban's 2016 offensive uh, sought to capture district centres and provincial capitals. <coughs> Fighting spread in northern Afghanistan, prompting mm -hmm. counterattacks by the Afghan forces, and also by militias led by former warlord and Afghan vi Vice President Dostum. Taliban attacks came close to capturing the provincial capitals of Aruzgan and Farah provinces. And fighting has been at its most intense in Helmand province. Uh, this saw the US forward deploy 700 advisors to better assist the hard-pressed Afghan forces in this area. Now, throughout the country, Taliban advances were contested by Afghan forces' counterattacks, and American officials now are saying that the Taliban controls about 10% of the Afghan population, about 25% is contested, and something between 60 and 65% of the population is controlled by the government. The UN has reported that the civilian casualties inflicted in the first half of 2016 had reached a record high since it began keeping records in 2009. And the casualties of Afghan forces are reported by the United States as being 5,500 killed and over 9,600 uh, wounded. Afghan army and police special forces continue to be held in high regard by the United States and NATO. <laughs> They often borne the brunt of offensive operations and have been successful, but these are operations that actually the conventional force should be conducting. In June 2016, key constraints on US forces in Afghanistan were reduced, giving them greater authority to support Afghan conventional forces with US firepower and to accompany and assist Afghan conventional forces. And this undoubtedly improved the combat effectiveness of the Afghan forces. Of course, President Obama announced in July 2016 that the planned drawdown of US forces would be delayed, um, with some 8,400 uh, remaining after January next year. These would continue to conduct counter-terrorism operations against Al-Qaeda, ISIS and other jihadist groups, and would also support the NATO train advice and assist mission, and NATO agreed to uh, the long-term sustaining of that, that mission in what it called a flexible <laughs> regional mode. Now, what we also saw uh, was the government of Afghanistan conclude a peace agreement with the Gulbuddin elements of Hezb-e-Islami. And it's quite clear that the Afghan government has begun bilateral negotiations with the Taliban office in Qatar. Now, absent a police deal, it will be essential that the Afghan forces use winter 2016-17 to learn the hard lessons of the year's fighting, particularly in terms of improving coordination between the different Afghan security forces and between them and provincial governors. And the Afghan forces will also need to continue to improve their logistics and their administration. 
So what about um, security cooperation across the Afghan-Pakistan bo Pakistan border? Um, currently, it seems that the political friction between Afghan and Pakistan is at an all-time all high, and practical, substantive intelligence, security and military cooperation is at an all-time low, and there's lots of blame going both ways ac ac across this. Um, accusations from Kabul that Islamabad is still sponsoring the Taliban insurgency <coughs> the Khani network, access allegations from Islamabad that the ungoverned space in southern Afghanistan provides opportunities uh, for non-state armed groups that wish the Pakistani uh, state harm. And of course President Ghani made an initial outreach <coughs> early in his term of office to both Islamabad and Rul Bindi, which was ultimately unsuccessful but cost him some valuable political capital. So what is to be done? The immediate priority is to prevent things getting worse. But this isn't going to be easy where there's so much mutual mistrust and suspicion. And this is exacerbated by the Afghan authorities' long memories and deep-seated suspicion of Islamabad's true intentions, or Pakistan's suspicion of India's motive, influence and presence in Afghanistan. And of course the lack of the agreed definition of the Durand line does nothing to help with this. But we have to be realistic. In the short term, until the Taliban threats to Kabul and key provincial capitals are satisfactorily neutralised and then pushed back, the amount of military and security capacity the Afghan government has to deploy on its side of the border is necessarily limited. <laughs> but it does seem to me that one area where the interests of Pakistan and Afghanistan converge is Daesh. Both countries recognise it's a threat, and its, and its potential eviction from the territory it controls in Afghanistan is a win-win to both, both countries. Of course, Afghanistan and Pakistan's interests would converge even more if there was a solid and substantive peace deal between the main body of the Taliban and Kabul. And, this could, and if this could be made to stick, it could have a transformative effect. Rahul. Thank you, Ben. <coughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Antoine Levesque. I'm a research associate for South Asia here. The God bless. God bless. In the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is um, take a step back and look at uh, two slower moving, less immediately visible trends, but uh, trends which I think are just as important as uh, some of the points which were made by my colleagues. The first one is China's continuously growing strategic ties with South Asia including the impact of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC. The second trend is the growing importance in grand strategy of the Indian Ocean, including its northern reaches, the Arabian Sea and the Gulf, Persian Gulf, I should say. So first, uh, China's strategic profile in South Asia. The past 12 months for China in South Asia, I believe, have been about implementation and managing short-term and long-term expectations. At stake here is China's ability to build and hold trust with countries on its periphery which are of lower priority than on its eastern side, but they're still very key um, countries uh, to draw to it. They, the, those countries are very interested in China's foreign policy east of Malacca, but they also have confirmed their keenness to seize economic and other opportunities to partner with a confident global power and Asia's only UN Security Council permanent member. But China is also having to walk policy tightropes to convince that its engagement is, is benign with those countries and its overtures respectful of neighbors' national interests. So first, let me look at CPEC, and then I'll have a look at um, China's Afghanistan policy briefly. So, as many of you know, um, CPEC is, um, is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Um, it's a plan with, uh, which China and Pakistan etched out in 2013, but really laid out uh, last year in, uh, in April, to use over the next 15 years at least $46 billion worth of Chinese origin funds to build three parallel interconnected north-south energy and infrastructure corridors in Pakistan from its coastline up to uh, the Chinese province of uh, Xinjiang. This project of projects is the largest single package of overseas funding Pakistan has ever been promised, and something which Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif of Pakistan called a fate changer recently. 
Pakistani policymakers and business leaders are determined to use this once in a lifetime opportunity to modernize their country. And on the Chinese side, um, Chinese now core leader Xi Jinping has a trillion dollar plus ambition of his own to rewire Eurasian <coughs> trade routes to China. CPEC is the pilot amongst five other projects of the so called Belt and Road Initiative. So looking at what has happened in the last um, 18 months on CPEC, I think there are two significant things. First, um, the US has been vo working very, very hard to uh, reassure Pakistan that it is unreservedly welcoming of CPEC. This is important because all, it's all too easy and frankly too simplistic to assume that CPEC is about Pakistan pivoting away from its ally um, of 15 years in the global war against uh, terrorism. It's also simplistic um, to think that the US is somehow automatically uh, against anything proposed by China. The US, much like the UK, the EU, um, sees CPEC uh, as an opportunity to stabilize Pakistan, um, its politics and economy. You can expect that this um, US inclusivity will come into its own in the coming months accompanying Pakistan and China's own goals to make CPEC a success for uh, what it is, but also a success for the broader region. And everyone, it's very clear to me, everyone in the region wants more connectivity um, between the different countries, which are notoriously unconnected. Um, the second point about um, CPEC in the last couple of, um, uh, last 18 months, is, um, is that Pakistan and China are mobilizing the decades of trust they have between them um, to really work out two <coughs> things. First, a pragmatic yet institutionalized uh, set of ways to not only um, implement CPEC but actually go into the details of it. So mobilizing their private and state sectors or building capacity, for example. The other point is that um, China and Pakistan are working um, to managing their str the strategic impact of CPEC. And that includes managing it um, in terms of their codependency, uh, making sure that this new state of affairs between them uh, actually grows their political relations. Um, this involves Pakistan providing security guarantees to, uh, to China. And China is also expected to ensure <coughs> that the benefits of, accru of CPEC accrue um, widely and equitably uh, to all Pakistanis. Um, China and Pakistan also know that it's in their interest to reassure India. And thirdly, because CPEC is a joint military, um, uh, civil military effort, um, CPEC has shot at the top of uh, the political and policy agenda in Pakistan. And we can expect that um, so-called early harvest projects uh, will play a role in the next general election in, the eight, in, in 18 months or so, as Rahul suggested. Um, the, imme the imminently expected change of guard at the top of Pakistan's military is unlikely, in my view, to bring about structural changes to CPEC because it is a national project. Very briefly, China's Afghanistan policy. Um, China is very confident um, of its increasingly visible role supporting the Afghan government and its peace efforts. China is one of four countries which has joined today and actively supports today also um, the Quadrilateral Coordination Group, which includes um, the US, Pakistan, um, Afghanistan and itself. Um, the QCG, as it is known, is designed to bring the Taliban to the negotiating table. In 2014, China uh, had facilitated Afghan-led and owned meetings on its soil, including with Taliban envoys. Prospects for talks have receded somewhat since, but it would not surprise me if China were still trying to reach to some uh, Taliban factions and help bring them to the table. After all, China and Afghanistan largely see eye to eye on counterterrorism issues. And of note in this regard um, is the creation of a regional military forum um, in August 2016, which includes China, um, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan and Tajikistan. Um, also directed to uh, counterterrorism. Now, my second point um, in my introduction was maritime security. So, um, here goes. The big picture first, perhaps. In the last 12 months, um, in response to rising uh, 
transnational threats, regional and global naval powers in the Gulf and the Indian Ocean have coordinated and cooperated more and sought to reinforce the seams in their national maritime strategies. At the same time, strategic competition has also sharpened between a number of countries in the region, making it ever more essential for security providers to um, insulate global shipping uh, from instability on land in other areas of global security or indeed in other parts of the world. So I have three sort of points of, of detail on this. Um, the first subtrend um, is the role uh, of the US and its allies in preserving stability at sea. I think that role is very much, um, very much there. Um, the Gulf supplies of hydrocarbons are going to East Asia, as we all know, China, critically India, and seen from South Asia um, at the same time, West Asia is once again under acute tension, um, Daesh being one, one element of this. The US Fifth Fleet, which is based in Bahrain, alongside France in the region, and the UK's new base in Bahrain, which is due to open next month, um, the US is the main security provider in the region and one of the guarantors of order and safety at sea, including also um, freedom of navigation. The US has handled with restraint <coughs> reported incidents at sea with Iran since the summer of 2015, um, and the US is, in, is able to also work with the Iranian Coast Guard uh, to ensure that um, the region remains uh, stable. In the last year, the US and GCC countries have also built maritime domain awareness capability between themselves and a greater ability to share information. The security benefits of this um, are welcomed uh, by everyone, including China, which, by the way, is expected to complete its first overseas permanent base in Djibouti next year. Um, I should also add, um, as a side note of it, that of this, but last month India reportedly um, commissioned its first um, nuclear-powered indigenous submarine, and this will also have uh, consequences for uh, Indian Ocean maritime security. Um, second point was to do with uh, non-traditional maritime security concerns, and those do remain a concern. The threat of piracy has come down. Um, but every uh, actor in the region is very clear that um, the importance of the issue cannot be um, uh, 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 underestimated and um, continued military presence is necessary to ensure that the threat does not re-emerge. India is very much part of this. Um, for example, it hosted a seminar um, uh, of one of the in informal international groupings in Mumbai um, earlier in February this year. And, of course, India is part of a military um, effort uh, on a voluntary basis to, to tackle piracy. There are also un other unregulated activities um, going on in the northern Indian Ocean. And um, in this sense, cooperation is still going on um, at, at, at very high levels. Um, eastward, um, the naval components of US CENCOM and PACOM work seamlessly um, across the Indian Ocean. Um, and a part of a broader effort, uh, which includes the Chinese, the Russian navies, to ensure that there is uh, also order at sea against any unregulated activities, be they um, terrorism or indeed uh, smuggling or other activities. I should add also that um, all those navies um, have an interest in undertaking military deployments for the reason that they also... Um, have other benefits um, uh, which they can draw from those. And for example, for China, the Indian Ocean remains a test bed of a number of deployment uh, concepts which it still works um, towards. Um, the US and China also have quiet cooperation on, uh, on maritime security on a bilateral basis in the Indian Ocean. I think this is, uh, this is something altogether um, easily forgotten in uh, the grand um, picture of their relations. And finally, another point is to refer to Pakistan, which um, early in August this year took command of uh, one of the task forces um, operating um, off uh, the coast of Somalia. And this is a, a great experience sharing and profile building exercise for the Pakistani Navy all the more so that it seeks to, um, to uh, put out in the next uh, few months or, or perhaps a little more a new maritime doctrine of its own. And finally, the Indian Ocean um, and cooperation there 
maybe one point, um, one development of sorts in the last um, in the last uh, year or so, uh, and this has been the um, uh, decision from India, um, Afghanistan, and uh, Iran to jointly develop the port of Chabahar um, on the uh, Iranian coast, uh, with India drawing in um, funds up to the tune of five hundred million dollars uh, in support. And I think in this sense, the most important point is to note that this is not a tit-for-tat reaction to uh, the energy, energetic work which uh, Pakistan and China are doing in the port of Gwadar, uh, basically 100 kilometers away. Um, I think we're seeing a far more nuanced picture emerge, um, and one of those nuances is, uh, is Iran's um, support for, um, for CPEC uh, generally in, in, in Pakistan. Um, but um, I'll, I'll probably have to stop here, but before I do, there are two points which I think are, are worth looking at, uh, in looking in the future and the future months. Um, one is, um, is the implications of continuous, continuously inbound Chinese investment into the Northern Indian Ocean maritime infrastructure. There was a very high profile from President Xi Jinping to Bangladesh last, uh, last uh, two weeks ago, and uh, that will, will be part of that bigger picture. And the last point I leave you with is, uh, is of course, the prospects for um, uh, increased Iranian presence in the uh, northern Indian Ocean and, and perhaps beyond. And I'll stop with that. Uh, thank you, Antra. I think uh, we presented uh, fairly sort of focused points uh, on a fairly large uh, canvas uh, of South Asia on political security, uh, economic uh, development. So we have now just under half an hour uh, for the discussion session. I'm very keen that uh, whoever would like to should have the opportunity to ask a question and make a comment. Uh, so within the next uh, half an hour, I'd be grateful if those who are making comments or asking questions could uh, keep their questions uh, focused and, and their comments uh, limited. But the floor is, is open now uh, for, uh, for, for discussion. So uh, over to you. I will collect a few names before I start the, the session. Uh, excellent. I've got the first uh, few list uh, names. Uh, let me start with Ambassador Ali Sawad Nakwi, the director of the CISS in Islamabad. Ambassador Nakwi. Well, I, I uh, thank you, Rahul. And uh, it's quite uh, accidental but fortuitous that I am here. I mean, this uh, delayed for this, but at least listening on what you people have. Uh, analyzed and assessed. Just a few comments that I uh, that came to my mind. You see, in regard to India-Pakistan, uh, the media trends are really very worrying because I go to Indian television from time to time. I mean, they uh, include me in the sat satellite. Uh, you know, connections from Islamabad, uh, and I, I, I am on some of the panels uh, for discussion. And they are extremely hostile to Pakistan. And th there is even, in some channels, they, they don't even let you speak. I mean, uh, they, 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 they just uh, go on uh, haranguing. So that is very worrying because the Warlike hysteria. I think in uh, the case of Pathan Court and uh, also uh, subsequently now Uri, uh, the uh, and then the surgical strike uh, was was played up in such a big way, and they reach uh, conclusions about Pakistan uh, without even waiting for any uh, uh, official. Uh, assessment of what has happened. So, I worry about it. In Pakistan, the media is also hostile to India, but the Indian media is extremely uh, hostile to Pakistan. Uh, so, that is one point. That regarding Daesh, you know, I, uh, I have been ambassador in Jordan for quite a few years, way back. This was in the 90s. 
uh, knowing the area where they have come from, knowing, uh, I mean, I know the almost uh, unmanned border with, uh, of uh, uh, Iraq and Syria, uh, I think the Daesh is very local. And <coughs> what is happening is that it's this jihadi thing that is permeating every uh, sort of uh, uh, country in the region, in the Middle East and South Asia. The, which is so Daesh is more like a franchise, and now with their uh, setbacks in Iraq, uh, I think uh, uh, the Daesh France franchise will also be uh, affected, and uh, it'll go back. Of course, I don't think that will be a, a very nice and uh, go back to, the, to that old jihadi thing of different movements or tanzims. Uh, and Afghanistan, you see, the Af from the Pakistani perspective, Afghanistan uh, is very upset with the uh, monitoring of the borders. And we think that, that this is absolutely uh, essential. Because for all these years, one reason why uh, we have had groups moving back and forth is because of poor border management. And we now strongly believe in border management, and government is determined to do it. Uh, maritime security, we are very worried about the nuclearization of the Indian Ocean, <coughs> uh, which is being undertaken by India. There are 32 littoral states uh, of the Indian Ocean. And it is against uh, the security interest of all these states if there is a nuclearization of the Indian Ocean. So, Sartaj Aziz, our advisor, has called for uh, a nuclear <coughs> weapon-free zone in the Indian Ocean. I mean, on land we can't do it, but at least on the sea we want to do it. Some of the comments, I don't want to yes. sort of go on and on. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Ambassador. Let me turn to the second speaker on my list, uh, Gotham Sen from the LSE. Gotham. Well, formal. Uh, formal. Very formal. timely uh, discussion that you initiated. It seems to me that one should always bear in mind uh, a question that has cropped up here many times, the non-negligible danger of escalation between two nuclear powers. We should always bear that in mind. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that because of the perceived change in the US position in South Asia, the cost of action has fallen. The cost of taking retaliatory action has fallen. That is a critical matter. But I don't think such issues were absent in the past. Such actions have been planned and not undertaken. Uh, I do not think there's any new roadmap for the future at all, but there are now <coughs> dangers that something untoward may occur because similar actions to the surgical, surgical strike are now pretty much guaranteed. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Shashank Joshi from the Royal United Service Institute. Thank you very much. I have a specific question. Um, Antoine, you talked about Chinese assistance in Afghanistan. We talked about Afghanistan-Pakistan relations. In the last um, six months, we've seen India transfer uh, transport helicopters, attack helicopters to, uh, to the Afghans, to NSF. And the Indian press is again reporting that they are in the process of potentially transferring more uh, armored vehicles, whether that is BMPs or tanks, it is entirely unclear. I'm just interested, uh, Ben and Jack, in sort of your military assessment as to whether outside, an injection of outside arms, whether that's airlift, attack, helicopter capability, armor, whether any of this fundamentally makes a difference to the ANSF's ability to reduce the insurgency, or whether this is all effectively just uh, a way of binding uh, uh, the states closer together. Is there any real military difference on the ground? Uh, could I, uh, before I take the next set of questions and comments, uh, could I just return to the panel and see if anyone would like to respond to the important comments that have been made, uh, and uh, Jack specifically if you'd like to respond first. Uh, to uh, the question that's been posed to you, if you want to also respond to the question. Yeah, I think uh, in terms, of, uh, interested in what Ben has to say, but I think in terms of uh, hardware uh, provided to Afghanistan from, from anyone, regardless, uh, we have to consider uh, two things. One is the quantity, and two is sustainability. Um, in, in part, there's a benefit of showing outside support merely from the fact that new material arrives in, in Kabul for use by the Afghan forces. Uh, and in particular, air capacity 
uh, be it the, the growing Afghan Air Force, very small, nascent, but nonetheless progressing, uh, supporting it, supporting the Afghan Air Force with uh, fixed-wing aircraft that are suitable for counterinsurgency and things like attack helicopters can be a big benefit. Uh, four helicopters is not going to change the dynamic in any dramatic way, but if that's supporting what the Afghans already have, and if that uh, provides a basis upon which other countries could build, not necessarily only India, but other places, then, then that can have a real impact on the battlefield vis-a-vis uh, -vis organizations like the Taliban. Uh, tanks and armored vehicles, I think much less so, but there is some role as U.S., U.K., and Canadian forces have found, uh, somewhat to people's surprise, for those kind of, uh, that kind of equipment, even in a counterinsurgency mode. I told you what to respond to this. Uh, um, maybe just to confirm um, Shashank's assumption, this idea that that yes, it is um, the defense um, 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 uh, cooperation um, uh, going on is between India and Afghanistan is 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 intended to reflect and and bolster the political um, relationship um, as part of a broader um, regional um, uh, strategy on the part of uh, of, uh, of Kabul. On the, the potential escalation dynamics, there appears in both the Indian and Pakistani media some responsible analysis by responsible media people that suggested the surgical strikes were what might be referred to in the British Army as fighting, fighting patrols. And you could interpret Pakistan's disavowal that the surgical strikes took place as a de-escalatory measure. You could interpret it that way. What the truth is, I don't know. But with regard to provision of Indian military hardware to Afghanistan, um, building the Afghan Air Force has been a protracted um, process which started far too late in building the Afghan security forces, and there's a lesson there. Um, and the, one of the limitations has been the human capital of Afghanistan. You need people who are numerate and literate um, to run your logistics. And the same applies to most equipment, equipment in the army. Uh, the other question that needs to be borne in mind is, is India just giving these, you know, a tank, a tank on a rail flat or a helicopter flying across? Or is it sending with it five or ten years' worth of spare parts, weapons, and everything that's needed to keep, to keep it in the air. Um, because we, without that sort of uh, full spectrum assistance, the utility Afghanistan might get um, could be pretty limited. Thank you. Could I now turn to Dr. Aisha Siddiqui, uh, who's an independent uh, military analyst from Islamabad. Aisha. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Rahul. Um, just a couple of questions. One is that uh, it was interesting to hear um, an international perspective, but as viewed from Pakistan, uh, there is a tendency to view these changes as, uh, you know, changes in a great game. That there is some great game to be organized in which there is United States and India on one side versus Pakistan, uh, which wants now to be part of a larger coalition comprising of China and Russia. Uh, so, just want would like somebody to comment on, you know, uh, that puts a different light to the arrangement as it's viewed in, in the United States, one. And the second thing is that I uh, recently had a chance to, to travel to Kabul, meet people there, and, and then coming back to Islamabad. How would you rate Chinese role in the future of Afghanistan in bringing some kind of peace and stability there? Uh, because China seems to be one country that Pakistan does listen to. And one final comment or question to Jack Gill, which is that these groups, uh, I mean, there is a lot of emphasis on Daesh, uh, which, is, which is largely a network. But with these different groups operating on the Pakistan, in the uh, Pakistan-Afghanistan border, and within Pakistan itself, lashkar e and other groups, and with no mechanism, to ensure that uh, you know, some of the good assets of Pakistan do not then break away and join Daesh or Al-Qaeda or other groups existing, uh, operating in, in, in Afghanistan and, and other parts of, of, of South Asia. 
uh, you know, what are the guarantee receipts? I mean, how do you then assess Daesh? And, and the power, that means that the power will continue to grow and destabilize the, the conditions there. Uh, thank you. Let me turn to uh, Caitlin Vito from the IISS. Yes, yes Caitlin. thank you. Uh, my question is for Antoine. You mentioned maritime security and the U.S. still being assessed as a guarantor. I was wondering in the lead up to the U.S. election, what your <laughs> this question I think about what your assessment was, um, whether actors in the region were positioning themselves in case of a potential Trump election or a retreat from the region where the U.S. in that scenario would no longer be guarantor that it has up until now played. Thank you. Vipul Thakur, WIWS member. ISS member Vipul Thakur. Terror attack in Bombay. Pakistan had enough opportunities to punish uh, the masterminds in Pakistan. But because of Pakistan's army's insistence, nothing happens. And they hope something else will happen and this will be kicked into long grass and forgotten. Pakistan has one adversary in India. India has two, Pakistan and China. Pakistan ignores China factor and wants equality with India. India's population is maybe six times larger than Pakistan. Its economy is probably 12 times larger than Pakistan. Every year, India's fast-growing economy produces GDP growth, which is probably more than total size of Pakistan's economy. So that equality is out of question. A comment. Thank you. Uh, let, let, me, let me just get back to the panel uh, to, uh, to respond to... Uh, some of the issues that have been raised, including the view from the United States on the greater global game, uh, China's role in the future of Afghanistan, where Antoine can take that. Maybe Jack, you can take the U.S. Uh, you know the the U.S. perspective on the greater global game, uh, Daesh, uh, for, and uh, for uh, Jack uh, and uh, Caitlin's question of maritime security for Antoine, and then uh, Ben and I will come in on on related issues. Uh, so let me start with. Uh, do you want to start or do you? I, I can, I can start, start, yeah. Uh, to Aisha's point, um, you know, the great game, I think it's partly down to a, 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 partly down to a belief of what you think history is about. Is history about, you know, cyclical things repeating themselves? Or is history always something new? And I, I would tend to side with the latter. So I think, um, I think you're seeing similar pictures um, um, arising. You're seeing uh, natural affinities being, um, being, uh, being rekindled, but... Um, you're also seeing a great deal of nuance, um, and I would uh, I would caution against uh, sort of seeing uh, um, seeing um, um, uh, 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 history repeating itself uh, altogether again. Um, the other assumption behind that point is is perhaps that uh, that Pakistan is not necessarily in charge of what is happening, that things are happening around it, despite it, and I. I don't. I, I really don't think that's the case. Um, Pakistan is is uh, is a sovereign country and is very much in charge of its uh, of its strategic destiny. Um, on the role of China in um, in in Afghanistan, um, I think that that role is uh, growing. As I said, it's becoming more visible. Um, I think the Chinese um, side is uh, is keener to take more risks. Uh, the fact that it's got involved into uh, reconciliation. Um, is, is testimony to this. Um, how far this is going to go, I, I cannot say. Um, it hasn't happened yet, by definition. Um, I think there's a lot of intent and, and goodwill in, in Beijing, which uh, may be for, uh, for various reasons, um, but we can probably see more, uh, expect to see more of the same in, in the coming months. I should add also that um, China, and Af uh, China and the US also have an understanding, I, I believe, uh, around um, uh, the priorities uh, which are uh, in place in, in, in Afghanistan. And um, I, I think that, um, that uh, Afghanistan acts as a sort of confidence um, building uh, um, 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 opportunity for those two countries, uh, considering how uh, otherwise uh, their relations may be uh, difficult. Um, the last point perhaps addressed to me was, uh, was about the, um, the Indian Ocean and maritime cooperation. Um, I think let's just see the, uh, the presidential play itself out and, uh, and then uh, see beyond. But uh, I, I think my understanding is that, uh, and I'm speaking under the control of uh, a U.S. national on, on the panel, but my understanding is that, uh, that policy shifts, do dramatic ones particularly, don't happen overnight. Um, things take time. And I think we're, we're looking at, uh, at something 
which, uh, which uh, in the short term shouldn't be uh, dramatically different. Uh, before I turn to Jack, uh, this is a good time if, you, if anyone else wants to raise their hand to ask a question or a comment because we are nearing the, the close of, of the session. Uh, so let me turn to, to, to Jack. Yeah, I, in, in terms of uh, larger geostrategic activity in, in the region and, and adjoining regions, uh, I would largely agree with Antoine. Uh, personally, uh, I do not think that people in Washington see some kind of great game playing out. And with all due respect to Mr. Kipling in a wonderful book, uh, <laughs> sadly that term is has been overused for the past uh, 15 to almost 20 years now. Uh, that. I, I don't, so I don't see anything along along those lines. I think, from a U.S. perspective, at least again in my personal opinion, uh, the desire is for collaboration across the board for prosperity and stability, uh, and that happens both on a bilateral level, U.S. Pakistan, U.S. India, U.S. China, and also in a multilateral kind of context, uh, in things like the quadrilateral uh, consultative group, uh, etc. So uh, that would be kind of my thought on that. On ISIS. Daesh, whatever we want to term it, uh, in, in South Asia. This is a great question and a really murky one and very hard to sort out what, um, what role they play or might play in the future. Uh, the, on the fearful side, the negative side, is that they uh, might provide a cover for existing groups who then opportunistically say, oh yes, and we hereby pledge allegiance to the, the Daesh leaders in Raqqa, etc., and then might shift assets, bomb making expertise, money, uh, gunslingers and escape car drivers and other low level fighters back and forth among different groups. So that's one, uh, one danger. The other danger is that ISIS characters might claim uh, that they were responsible for as they did in this dreadful attack in Quetta recently. Uh, and perhaps they had something to do with that, perhaps not. Perhaps there's some real connection between Daesh and the Lashkari Jangvi, and perhaps there's not, and it's just an opportunistic claim. Oh, yes, yes, this bad thing happened in Pakistan, and we hereby uh, claim, uh, claim responsibility. On the favorable side, I would just echo what Ben said, which is that this also, however, provides an area where all of the countries of the region, as well as most external actors, are looking for ways to denature, disarm, uh, and... and delegitimize this Daesh outfit. So there's a possibility for collaboration, cooperation, at least tentative, uh, to build up some, some trust and confidence to work together to undermine something that threatens all of us as human beings. Thank you, Doug. Uh, ben? Uh, don't forget that the Taliban are also against Daesh. That's it. <laughs> okay, let me have the la let me start the last two questions. Uh, yes, the gentleman, uh, yes, please. Uh, Charles Vivian, I wonder, could I ask a question about the two belts or roads, the Chabahar one and the Guado one, you rather glossed over the relationship between the two, or indeed is a relationship between the two, and what is the aim of having two, which is reasonably close together, uh, both at their end and actually during their progress through Central Asia. And the last question, Diva Padang. Yes, yes, I've got a question for myself. So I personally think that if there is no peace in Afghanistan, I don't think there, is, there will be peace around the region as well. So um, do you think that CPAC will, can be a successful project uh, if Pakistan continues giving sanctuaries to terrorist groups? Thank you. Um, two difficult questions, um, partly because in both cases I don't think um, things have, um, uh, have, have played themselves out entirely. Um, on um, on Gwadar and, um, and Chabahar, um, I think um, as far as the the the, um, the literature goes and and uh, official statements go, I don't think I've seen a, a statement uh, which would uh, link the two um, directly. Um, but I stand to be corrected if anyone has seen that statement. Um, but um, but there is there was a meeting on the sidelines of the uh, UN General Assembly in New York in last month. And um, between uh, Pakistan Prime Minister and um, and the uh, the Iranian leader, and um, if you look at the joint uh, at the two statements which the two sides put out after that meeting, you did get a sense that um, that there could be um, some form of uh, of uh, interoperability, to use a, a a sort of military term, uh, between those two um, those two ideas. Um, now the details would have to be worked out. 
um, you know, thorough discussions would have to take place, but I see that as a, as a, as a nuance which I think is encouraging for connectivity regionally. Um, but this doesn't take the edge off the fact that we do have two projects um, relating to two ports which um, are both um, within a small distance of one another and um, that does raise questions around um, what the purpose of duplicating infrastructure may well be. Um, when it comes to CPEC and I think it was <coughs> Afghanistan, was, was that your point? I mean, we've very clearly seen, um, I think your former finance minister 10 days or so ago made a statement in support of CPEC. My understanding is that Afghanistan supports CPEC in so far as it could bring to Afghanistan benefits, which has uh, so far eluded it, uh, both in terms of connectivity and directly in terms of, uh, of trade. But again, we're looking at very long timelines here, and the very sense I get is that CPEC is essentially for the moment a bilateral operation between um, China and Pakistan when it comes to actual implementation of the, uh, the routes. And the regional connectivity aspect of it will come into its own only in a sort of second phase of, uh, of, of CPEC. And uh, there has been implementation of CPEC this year. That was uh, a point I, I, I mentioned that I didn't look at specifics, there are roads, there are various uh, projects which are being uh, completed. Um, Guadar received its first, um, uh, its first shipment from a major uh, ship, um, I think last month or last week. Um, there are signs and um, we'll have to see how all of this works, but in both cases CPEC is a long project. I said the plan is 15 years, it could be longer, so let's, let's see how it plays out. We're only in sort of year one since the announcements were made last year. And at the most, year, um, year sort of three and a half, uh, with reference to initial discussions about CPEC in 2013. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> on that note, uh, we are going to uh, end uh, this discussion session. I would just like to add uh, two things. One, that uh, this session has been entirely on the record. Uh, so if those who would like to report it are, are free to do so, we will also be putting the entire discussion online. Uh, in the next uh, in the next day or two uh, uh, on our on our website at the IISS. and secondly I would just like to thank uh, my panelists uh, uh, for two things first I think incisive comments but equally important for sticking to the time I think <laughs> you, you know we have sort of eight to ten minutes uh, by each and I think for the institute I think that's very important and commendable that we're able to do that so uh, I'd like to uh, ask all of you to join me in thanking <laughs> the panel.